Well, praise God. It's good to have Fred and Drew back. Uh, we've missed you guys. Uh, pr praise the Lord for you. And it's good to have Melissa and Chris. And uh, there's a little one, first time here, little Joshua. And uh, there's three big girls with you that I have no idea who they are. They're so big. Man, they change in such a, a short amount of time. So, so good to have you folks here. Pr praise the Lord for you. Um, uh, let's open up our Bibles to Romans chapter 9, and we're going to begin again Romans chapter 9. It's incredible to look at Romans chapter 9 because the whole demeanor changes as you come into this chapter from chapter number 8. Chapter number 8 was so celebratory, and that is again the security of our salvation, our the assurance of being in Christ and forever being in Christ. And we saw that there's nothing at all in all of creation that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. We're absolutely assured. You know, those who are in Christ can never be taken out of Christ. And it's incredible how the Apostle Paul goes doctrine after doctrine, truth after truth, to bring out this necessary truth of our salvation that you just want to stand up, you just want to cheer, you just want to shout, you know, how secure we are in Jesus Christ. And uh, let me just say this, it's amazing to look at biblical preaching because biblical preaching is different than just um, uh, teaching or giving a lecture. Yeah, teaching and giving a lecture many times are just giving information out. You know, I want you, I want you to know these truths. I want you to know how this works or whatever it happens to be. But biblical preaching always uh, calls for a response in the listeners. You know, whether it happens to be inspire them to persevere in the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, whether it happens to be, again, giving them a peace in the midst of the storm, whether it happens to bring, bring conviction of sin that happens to be in their life, whether it happens to give them a further trust in Jesus Christ. Well, what we do when we preach is we're calling for a response. It's not just a simple teaching. It's not, not simple, a simple lecture. But for many preachers, their whole goal is just to bring conviction, conviction of sin. You know, and they almost delight in it, you know, to preach about sin and see everyone with their heads hung low as they, as they leave. You know, that to them is a successful uh, preaching sermon. And it's not that we don't want to point out sin. We do want to point out sin. But the whole idea is not just to bring people low. It's to raise them up. It's, it's that they might see Christ, that they might trust Christ, that they might follow the Lord Jesus Christ, that they might see the remedy of their sin, which happens to be Jesus Christ and him alone. You know, and that's the whole goal. So the reason why we preach on sin is to get to Jesus Christ. And the reason why we want to get to Jesus Christ is basically two things. It's because we care about people, we love people, we have a concern for people, and the second one is that we want to see Christ magnified. We want to see Christ trusted. We want to see Christ exalted in their life. But we really do have a burden. We do, really do have a care for God. So even though we don't want to preach about these things, they're necessary in order to get to the Lord Jesus Christ because we care about the eternal plight, the eternal welfare of those who happen to be again around us. You know, and this was really brought home a number of years ago. My wife and I were on vacation and... Uh, we were visiting again a couple, and uh, they, they had a new, new pastor. It was new again, um, relatively speaking. He was there for three or four months, and they could hardly wait for us to hear them. Um, they, they told us that he was dynamic, you know, he was a great preacher. And when we came out to, to, to hear, them, hear him, uh, he did an okay job at handling the Word of God. You know, it was not mind-shattering uh, uh, or earth-shaking. You know, uh, there was a few things that he might have left out, you know, uh, as far as his exposition of the Word of God. But when we got back to the home and we started to discuss the message, again, they, they were just thrilled. They hung on every word, everything, again, that he said, again, both about sin and both, both about the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, and what was the difference between their response and my response to it? The difference is that they knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that their pastor cared for them, that their pastor lo loved them. So when he preached again about sin in their life, they realized he wasn't taking delight in it, but he really cared for their souls. You know, and he cared for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. He wanted them to follow the Lord Jesus Christ and magnify again him. And it was a great burden for the people when he preached the word of God. 
You know, and let me say, say, say the whole point that happens to me right here is that that's the same burden that all of us should have towards those who are outside of Jesus Christ, to those, again, who are the lost, to those, again, who do not know Jesus Christ. The great burden of our hearts is for them to know Jesus Christ. And that's the amazing thing, because we can celebrate, on one hand, the eternal security of the believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, that nothing can separate us from the Lord Jesus Christ. But the corollary truth of that is those who are not in Christ are eternally damned. They're under the judgment. They're under the just wrath of God and are, they will be there forevermore if they go out of this life not trusting the Lord Jesus Christ. So at all the time when we look at these truths, we realize, again, there are two sides, again, to the same. Uh, there's two sides on that coin. And if you preach one, one truth, then the other has to be true. And when we preach on eternal security, when we preach that Jesus Christ is the only way and salvation is found in him alone, then the other side of that coin tells us about those who are lost. You know, and I wonder, are we burdened for the lost? You know, when was the last time we tried to articulate the message to somebody who happens to be outside of the Lord Jesus Christ? You know, I think a lot of times we forget about the plight of the lost. My wife and I were watching the Sing conference uh, this week, and one of the stats that they threw out was uh, among those who happen to be churchgoers, in other words, those who attend church, um, not just evangelicalism in its broader sense, but those who attend church, only 17% knew what the Great Commission was. I mean, 17%. Think about that, because we do not even know what the mission of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, again, happens to be. You know, if we don't know what the mission of the church, again, how, could, how, how would we ever have a burden to go out? And when you think that 17% know, but it doesn't mean that 17% have a burden to even to reach the lost. There's probably a small fra fragment of those, again, who have a great desire to reach the lost. And I wonder about you. You know, as you look at the people that you work with, as you look again at extended family member, uh, members, maybe neighbors that, that you know, that have no relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, are you ever moved, are you ever burdened again by their plight that they truly do not know the Lord Jesus Christ? You know, I want us to look at this desire again of the Apostle Paul, this burden of the Apostle Paul in the opening three uh, verses. And then after that, I, I, I just want to bring an application uh, to it, and I hope, again, it will be helpful and challenging with us this morning, but I, I want us to see the meaning of the opening three verses, and let's just read through them again, and read through them very, very meditatively, you know, looking at these clauses. Look, look at what Paul says. He says, I am speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears, bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have a great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. And it is amazing, isn't it? Because God in his goodness has given us a whole range of emotion. You know, and the reason why we have this whole range again of emotion is because we're made in the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. And because we're made in the image of the Lord Jesus Christ, because we're made in the image of God, there's appropriate times that we have these emotions, and there's inappropriate times that we have in these emotions. But here's, here's the thing that I want you to get. There's times where we should rejoice. There's times where we should be delighting. There's times where we should be, again, happy. If we weren't delighting, if we weren't rejoicing in these times, then we'd be ungodly individuals. We really wouldn't care about other people, and we wouldn't care about the glory of God. And there's other times, again, that we should be mourning. There's other times, again, that sorrow should so envelope our hearts. And the reason why is because we love God. We love who he is. You know, and if we did not feel those emotions, then we wouldn't be uh, a godly individuals. You can see that even in Psalm chapter 1 and verse number 2. It says, it's talking about the um, uh, blessed man, the godly man. It says, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. So when you look at the blessed man, when you look at the godly individual, the godly individual is someone who delights in God's word. Why? Because it tells us about this God. It tells us again about who he is and, 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 and how to follow him. So much so that we want to follow this great God that happened at the beginning of the scripture. You know, but there's other times where we should be sorrowing. 
And you even see this in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, the shortest verse in the New Testament happens to be, again, uh, where Jesus comes before Lazarus' tomb. And he sees this great sorrow that happened to be there. And we have these two words, Jesus wept. You know, and there's appropriate times. Here's the perfect man. There's appropriate times where we should weep. We should mourn. We also have Jesus coming in Jerusalem just before the last Passover, just before he gives his life as that perfect offering for sin. And he laments over the city. He says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophet and stones those who are sent to it. How often I would have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing. And here, Jesus Christ comes into the city and he recognizes the rejection of the people. And he's heart stricken by this. Their lostness that happened to be again right there. And then I wonder again, as we look at our lives, as we look at the people that God has put into our life outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, if it even occurs to us that these people are going to spend eternity somewhere. And it's either going to be praising God or under his again eternal wrath. Does it even occur to us? You know, do we have a concern? Do we have a passion to see them come to a saving knowledge of Christ? You know, and Paul, again, as he begins this chapter, wants us to know the validity of this desire that he has. So he begins in verse number one. He says, I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears witness in the Holy Spirit. And notice how this chapter starts, because it doesn't start with a for, and, then, but, uh, maybe, because, you know, uh, and the reason why is this is a whole new section. He's been giving a, a whole new, again, uh, section that runs from 9-1 all the way through the end of chapter number 11. But he wants us to know he's given us a personal testimony to begin this chapter. And he says, I want you to know the truthfulness, again, of this testimony. So, so he calls again, he says, I'm speaking the truth, and then he says this, in Christ. You know, that's the sphere, right? I'm speaking this truth, and then he says these words, in Christ. Christ. And it means two things. It means all those who are in Christ, in Christ Jesus, our Lord, should have this same desire as the Apostle Paul. All of us should have it. You know, if we're in Christ, if we're lovers of Christ. The second thing that it tells us, that Jesus Christ is a witness to the validity of these words of the Lord Jesus Christ. And right after that, he goes on and says, I am not lying, my conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit. And I love that, right? My conscience, when we realize the conscience, conscience is inside. And it can either acquit us or it can bring heavy guilt that happens to be upon us. And we realize the conscience in and of itself is, is uh, not inerrant. Yet, you know, it's not always right. We can sin against our conscience. We can harden ourselves so, so much so that we can do sin and we don't even feel, again, a conviction that happens to be there. But if we feed ourselves, if we let the word of Christ richly dwell within us, then we're going to be controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. And right here, Paul is saying the Holy Spirit of God, he's bringing witness number one and, the, and also Jesus Christ of the witness of the validity of the words that he's speaking. So he brings two members of the triune God as forth as witnesses to the truth of this burden that he has. And he speaks again of this burden and how great it is in the next verse. He says that I have a great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. And when he says again sorrow and anguish there, there's not too, too much of a difference that happens to be there. You know, both words are words of grief, you know, intense grief that happens to be there. And when he says again, I have a great sorrow, it means it is great. It's not just an, an inconvenience that happens to be in his life. It's not like stubbing your toe and you know, again, in a little while, it's going to get better. You know, this is a great grief. This is a great sorrow. And he also says an unceasing anguish. And that's so picturesque, isn't it? I don't know if you've ever had unceasing anguish. I've, I've had in, unceasing anguish. You know, I've, I've had burden, again, over things in my life and things, again, that happen to be in other people's lives. And the moment you wake up in the middle of the night, well, well, what do you think about? You, it's unceasing. It's always there. You think of this anguish. You think of this sorrow. You think of this grief that you are going through, this grief and concern that you have for somebody else. You know, it's always there, isn't it? 
You know, so we can be in the midst of a celebratory time where everybody is happy, everybody is joyous, and we catch ourselves all of a sudden, think about that, and our whole mood changes. You, you know, there's this heaviness, there's this grief that comes over us. And I think all of us can relate to what the Apostle Paul is saying here. Where we can't relate many times is what he is grieving about. Because look at what he says in verse number three. He really brings us up. He says, For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. And look at the word for, because it's explaining this anguish. It's explaining this sorrow that happens to begin in his life. And he says, for I could wish. And I'm going to talk about that whole phrase, for I could wish, in a second. But I want you to see what his burden was. His burden, again, according to this verse, again, happened to be for his fellow countrymen. He says, for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. In other words, again, it's, it's not the people of God that he's talking about, but he's talking about, again, the unbelieving Jew that was outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what was the problem of the unbelieving Jew? Well, he brings that up in chapter number 10. In verses 2 to 4, he says, For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God. In other words, they're zealous for the God and the things of God. But he goes on and says this, But not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own righteousness, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And when he says Christ is the end of the law, this is what he means by this. Christ is the goal of the law. Christ is the completion of the law. Christ is the end, right? right, right. He has brought it. He has served it. He, he, he has gone through. He has fulfilled all of the law. And, and he's the end. And that's why our righteousness has been made available. It's been made available to the Lord Jesus Christ. But here's the Jews who have the Old Testament scripture, and they have a zeal for God. But he goes on right after that, and he says it's not according to knowledge. It's amazing, isn't it? The one group of people that should have known where righteousness was found was the Jews, and they didn't. And the reason why they were seeking it, again, by their good works. And it says this, so they did not submit. And it's an incredible truth because it's speaking of the same truth about the Gentiles that we find in Romans chapter number one, that they suppress the truth that can be known, right? You can look out, you can see that there is a God that all of us are, but they suppress it. Here it is the same truth. They're suppressing. They will not submit. Even though it's clearly taught in the Old Testament, they will not submit to the righteousness of God that is found in the Lord Jesus Christ by faith alone in the Lord Jesus Christ. And they, and they try to establish their, their, their own. And let me, let me say this about this. When you look at works, works, works righteousness, it is the natural bent of our own human co uh, compass. So in other words, when we're left by ourselves, when we try to earn salvation, when we try to again look at salvation, our bent is to really believe that we're not all that bad, uh, that we're quite good, that we've earned a position before God. We can look at other people. We can look at what they are going through. We can look again at what they are doing. And we can look at ourselves and judge that we are more righteous than them. And the natural bent that happens to be again of the human compass is right here. That I'm really not that bad. And what Paul says is that they, even though they know the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, they do not have a knowledge. They are ignorant of this. And that's why God has sent us as witnesses into the world. He sent us to testify, again, of the scripture, of the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, because people don't know. You, you, you know, I'm always amazed at this. You know, there's billions and billions and billions and billions of people that happen to be on planet Earth that will never hear a gospel presentation. They will never hear again the truths again of Jesus Christ. There's people in our community. There's people that we rub shoulders with every day that will never hear the gospel. That will never hear the truth of Jesus Christ and him crucified. That there's a God above. That we are sinners. That Christ is a merciful redeemer. And we need to respond in repentant faith to this great God. They're all around us. You know, and here they are. They do not have this knowledge. They live in ignorance of that knowledge. And God again sends you and me. And Paul again has this great burden. And the reason why he has a great burden, even as he says, is not only are they kinsmen according to the flesh, but he says again, I could wish that I myself were, were cursed and cut off. In other words, these people are cursed 
They're cursed of God. They're under the condemnation of God. They're under the wrath of God. To be cut off, again, is, is, is the opposite of us. Remember what we just celebrated? Nothing, absolutely nothing will separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. These people are, we cannot be cut off. These people are cut off. They are separated. And so there's this great anguish that happens to be of the Apostle Paul. But I want to take a few moments and really look at that phrase where that Paul says, I could wish. Uh, there's much talk about this phrase, and that's why, again, I really want to discuss it. Because Paul doesn't say this. He doesn't say, I wish, but Paul says, I could wish. In other words, again, I don't wish this because I know, again, that this is not, uh, this is not in God's economy. This will not come to pass. You know, and a lot of people will say, well, why can't Paul wish that he can give his life as a replacement for another sinner, uh, one of his countrymen or some of his countrymen that happen to be over here. And we realize the easy answer for that. The easy answer for that is Paul's a sinner just like us. And a sinner cannot substitute his life for a sinner. But the argument against that would be this. Well, Paul is a righteous sinner. Otherwise, he has a righteous standing before God based upon him being in Jesus Christ. Why can't he take that righteous standing in Christ and give it to somebody that happens to be again over there? And I think that's a valid question, isn't it? You know, why can't I say that I'm going to sacrifice? And, and if Jesus Christ, the great God-man in human flesh, came to give his life as a perfect offering for sin, we would say that this is a godly wish, that this would be a godly objective of each one of our life. We're following in the footsteps of Christ. So why doesn't Paul say, I wish? Why does Paul say, I could wish? You know, and why can't we wish that way? And I think that's a good question. You know, and I think the answer really is not difficult, though. I think the answer is given all the way through chapter number 8. In fact, again, we even read it in the last two verses of chapter number 8, where he says, For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things uh, present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Right? There's nothing, not even me, can separate ourselves from the love that happens to be again in Christ Jesus. It's a wonderful truth, isn't it? And the moment I say that I can take myself out of the Lord Jesus Christ in order to put somebody else in Jesus Christ, we're saying two things about God. One is we're saying that there's a greater power than God. You, you know, if the Father says that there is nobody, absolute no, nobody, if the Son says there is nobody, absolute nobody, that can snatch you out of my hand, then there has to be a power greater. And that, power, uh, that, that greater power is you or me, who takes ourselves out of Jesus Christ to put somebody else in. Not only that, but the second thing that we're saying about God is that there's greater love. He says, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, a greater love. There's somebody, again, there's some greater love, the love that I have for the sinner right here. And what God says, no, there's no greater love. There, there's no greater love. My love is able to keep. Our, my, 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 my love is able to fulfill all of these promises in love. And even for the sinner that happened to be over there, there's no greater love of God for the sinner than God himself. Right? And we realize this. We realize the greatest lover happens to be God. But let me just say this. This is an extraordinary passion of the Apostle Paul, an extraordinary burden that he has for those who happen to be, again, outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't think a lot of times we think about how extraordinary he is. Because I, I think the people that Paul should naturally hate most in his life, and I'm saying naturally, happen to be the Jews. Isn't it true? The ones who harangued him, opposed him, persecuted him, maligned him, absolutely hated him, were none other than, than the Jews, his fellow countrymen. I mean, everywhere that he went, they opposed him. You know, there's an example again of how strong this hatred against the Apostle Paul happened to be in Acts chapter 23. Paul is arrested, you know, and the next day he appears before the uh, Sanhedrin, and there's this plot that happens to be again placed upon Paul uh, by these men. In Acts chapter 23 and verses 12 to 14, it reads this. When it was days... The Jews made a plot and bound themselves by an oath, neither to eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. There were more than 40 
who had made this conspiracy. They went to the chief priests and elders and said, we have strictly bound ourselves by an oath to taste no food till we have killed Paul. I mean, that's quite strong, isn't it? It's saying our normal life, we've made an oath, we've made a promise before God that our normal life is going to be interrupted. We're not going to eat, sleep, we're not going to go back to our normal duties of work or anything else until we have killed Paul. I mean, that's an amazing, an amazing, again, um, uh, uh, oath that they make. And even the religious leaders say, okay, okay, fine. And this is done by more than 40 individuals that want to uh, hunt down and terminate the life of the Apostle Paul. You know, not only that, he suffered physical anguish, you know, physical turmoil at the hands, again, of these um, uh, his fellow countrymen, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 24, reads this, five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes, less, less one. Less one means that he only had 39. And 39 was a way of mercy, that, that we didn't give you the full amount. And, 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 and it is amazing because a lot of times we read that and we just go on to the next verse and the next verse and the next verse. But to be lashed, what it had was leather straps, and at the end of these leather straps, long leather straps, were bone, a metal, glass. You know, and the person who gave out, gave out the lash was an absolute expert at wrapping it around the individual, so much so that it tore the skin off the back. You know, and as he had these 39 lashes, his back would have been all torn apart. It would have taken months and months and months and months and months to heal. And then after it healed, it would never be the same again. There would be scar tissue. He, would be, he wouldn't be able to move in the right way. And you can imagine, here's Paul, and he has this concern for his fellow countrymen, and he preaches the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's lashed for it. And he preaches the gospel again, and he's lashed for it. Now, let, let me ask you, what would your response be? What would your response be after once or twice? I will never preach the gospel to that group of people again. I mean, isn't that natural? You know, if, if they're going off in a crisis eternity, then they deserve it. Let them go. You know, wouldn't it be there? You know, but Paul goes once, twice, three, four, five times. You know, and you would think that the natural response, the, well, the natural response is, would be to hate these people. You know, to, to really despise them. And the question we have to ask ourselves as we think of this, you know, what, how did Paul have this great burden? You, you know, what, what made in the Apostle Paul, in my heart, in my conscience, in my inner person, I have this strong desire, I'm in complete anguish over the plight of my fellow countrymen. I mean, how is that made in the Apostle Paul? And let me say, say this, I think this is so germane. And the reason why I think it's so germane is because there's so much hatred that happens to be in our world today. Isn't it true? I mean, in the last uh, five, six months, we've seen this bubble over in our society. You know, we've seen this arguing. You know, we've seen, again, racism. Uh, we've seen, again, uh, hatred over, over be, be, uh, because people uh, speak a different language or come from a different culture. You know, and you see this hatred and hatred and hatred and hatred. You know, I don't know how many times I've talked to an unsaved person, you know, and they care many times deeply about these issues. And, and I said, well, if you care about these issues, you should want Christianity to be true. You should understand the message of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and what our God promises us. Because we realize there's coming a day where all this hatred, all of this animosity is going to be over. And, before, and, before, and every tribe, every language, every tongue, every race is going to be gathered before the throne of God, praising the Lamb that was slain before the foundation again of the earth. And you know what the secret of missions is? The secret of missions is recognizing that truth. It's recognizing that truth. That our God is worthy of worship. 
Our God is worthy to be praised. Our God is this big, this magnificent, that when I look at that individual, when I look at my enemy, when I look at all the harm that he's done, I realize that he's going to spend an eternity somewhere. And it's either going to be praising God, my God is worthy of all praise, or it's either going to be under the judgment of God. And I so want my God to be praised and honored and glorified. And that's the strength, isn't it? The more you recognize who God is, the more you recognize that he's worthy to be praised by those who curse him now. You know, I love what John Piper says about this in his book, Let the Nations Be Glad. He says, where passion for God is weak, zeal for missions will be weak. Churches that are not centered on the exaltation of the majesty and beauty of God will scarcely kindle a fervent desire to declare his glory among the nations. Even outsiders feel the disparity between the boldness of our claim upon the nations and the blandness of our engagement with God, right? Boldness. There's no boldness among the nations, and why? There's a blandness with God. And you see, you see the problem is never horizontal. The problem is I just can't love those people. I just can't get over what so-and-so did. You know, and, he, and Paul's not saying that I have this great desire because these people are so great and so lovely. That's not what he's saying. You know, it's the exact opposite. You know, and, and, and we many times focus horizontally. Horizontally is the problem. Horizontal. No, the problem is vertically. When I recognize this God, look at who he is. Look at what he's done. Look at what Christ has done. He's worthy of all worship for all of eternity. And this person will spend eternity somewhere, either praising God again or under the judgment of God, that I want them. I desire most of all that they would praise him because my God is worthy of worship. My God is worthy to be praised for all of eternity. Do you recognize that? Because when we realize this burden and the more we fill ourselves with the greatness of God, the question we have to ask ourselves is, how do we take this burden? And how, how do we put it in action? How do we put feet to this? You know, and what, what, what I, I'm always amazed by scripture. I, I, I don't know about you and how God has constructed it. Because right after Romans chapter 9, it speaks of eternal election. In other words, God has decided beforehand who will be saved. He has selected them. And it's all his doing. It's not based upon anything that they would do bad or anything that they would do good. It's up to him and his sovereign selection alone. Right after chapter number 9, you have chapter number 1. What is it? I'm going to see how theological you are. You have chapter what? 10. There was a few of you said chapter number 11, but most of you got it right. It's chapter number 10. You know, and right there we see how Paul meshes these together as far as sovereignty, again, and um, human responsibility. And he says in, in, um, in uh, verse number one of that chapter, the first thing we ought to be doing. He says, says, brothers, my heart desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. Right? I got this desire, and where do I go? I go to God. Why do I go to God? Because he's the only one who can change the human heart. I'm always amazed because we'll debate Arminianism, our free will, and Calvinism, God's sovereign election, God's sovereign choosing in election. And the thing that I'm always amazed about that is because in prayer, everybody praises a Calvinist. Isn't it true? You know, oh, God, just change the circumstances. Don't, don't, don't somehow invade their free will, you, you know, because you can't do that anyways. No, no, everyone whether they believe in free will, whether they believe in sovereign election, praise like a Calvinist. God, convert their heart. God, change their heart. Cause them to believe on you. Don't we? You, you know, and why do we do that? Because we realize if anyone is going to come to salvation, it's through, it's through the power of God, right? We realize that the same God who ordained who will come to a saving knowledge of Christ, also ordained the means. And the means, one of the means to bring the lost to Jesus Christ is through God-ordained prayers. You know, those prayers that we offer up in burden of other individuals. But let me ask you, when was the last time you prayed for somebody outside of the Lord Jesus Christ? And I'm not talking about general prayers. You know, we can get there and we can be so melancholy. We can be so apathetic and say, God... Save those that happen to be in our community, in our, in our city. 
Lord, plant New Testament churches throughout Canada. You know, we want you to be praised. Amen. But, but how, how many people do we come in contact with that we identify this person, that person, this person? I'm going to pray for this person. God, do a work of grace in their life. Open up their heart. May they see Christ. May they bow the knee to him. Lord, we know that you can do this. Please do this work in their heart and in their life. I mean, how, how, how many times uh, do we come and do we really pray for those who happen to be outside of the Lord Jesus Christ? And then the other thing that we do, right? We not only use this means of prayer, but he also uses the verbalization of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, we articulate you know, and the gospel's not a difficult message. You know, so many people say, say, can you teach me how the gospel so I can preach it to other people? And it's just four truths. There is a God. We are sinners. Christ is a merciful redeemer, right? The necessary response to those truths is to recognize my sin, feel awful about my sin, and trust in Jesus Christ and him alone. Just those four truths. It isn't a difficult message. You don't need a PhD. And listen to what Paul says, because here, here it is. You know, well, whatever God has decided will come, will come. And then we just sit back. And then he says these truths in chapter number 10 and verse number 14. He says, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how will they believe in him of him who they have not heard? And how will they hear without someone preaching? I mean, it is amazing, isn't it? I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that that individual will not come to Christ, that individual will not come to Christ, that individual will not come to Christ, that will, if nobody ever witnesses to them. No one ever testifies. Because Paul says again right here, how will they believe when they have not heard? God's ordained how he's going to bring them. And it's through you and I verbalizing and articulating the message of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know Christians who've been saved decades and have never spoken the truth of Jesus Christ and him crucified to individuals that God has placed in their life. You know, and this is not just given to pastors. It's not just given to the spiritual elite. But these marching orders, as far as the Great Commission, is given to all of us. You know, you know, my wife and I had a wonderful opportunity this week uh, to watch the Sing Conference, that's the Getty uh, Conference, and really be challenged again with the Word of God this week, and we're so thankful for it. And um, uh, it started its live broadcast at 7 o'clock in the evening, and it went probably to 11.30. I can only go to 10.30. You know, I have one eye shut, and the other eye is going back and forth, back and forth. Uh, but uh, we really enjoyed it, and we were really challenged. And one, one of the things that I was really encouraged by and even challenged by was the ministry, the ongoing ministry of Rav, uh, Ravi Zacharias, who, who had died this year. He, he was a Christian apolo, uh, apologist. You know, and when, uh, when you see the coronavirus and everything shut down, it's incredible how they put this whole ministry online and how so many people, again, are involved in it. And they're reaching various different peoples, various different cultures. And it's going out and out. And its reach is so expansive. It is absolutely amazing. You know, I'm so thankful that for missionaries who many times preach the word of God, like the hunters. And let me, let me say it again. If you listen to the hunters tonight, you're going to be absolutely amazed at everything that you've been doing. You know, and they've had such tough time, such t tough restrictions during this coronavirus, a lot tougher than, than we have. And it's incredible, again, how they've been reaching out. You know, I'm thankful, again, for the Carlisles in C Cambodia. I'm thankful, again, that we have um, uh, m uh, uh, families that are committed to planting churches in Canada, and we can partner with them, whether it happens to be in Quebec or whether it happens to be in uh, British Columbia. I'm thankful for that because we cannot be there and it's so easy to look at what people are doing, you know, this bigness of what people are doing and the glory of what people are doing that many times we just excuse ourselves and say we can't do that. And you're absolutely right. We cannot do that. But we can build redemptive relationships. You know what a redemptive relationship is? I'm going to have a relationship with this individual with the whole goal of presenting the gospel. You know... When somebody cold knocks on our door and we open the door, we're saying, how long can I get through this, you know, before I can shut the door? And why? Because we don't know them. They're waiting. Their words hold no weight. 
But when I establish a relationship with somebody, when I love them, when I get interested in the things that they're interested in, when I have them over for supper, when I spend time with them, with the whole goal that I might be a testimony, witness of the Lord Jesus Christ, and may be able to preach the gospel to them. That's different. That's a redemptive relationship. You know, and God has established relationships in all of our life, all of our lives with people outside of Jesus Christ. We have them at work. We have extended family members. We have our neighbors. You know, and just taking an interest that this person right here will spend eternity somewhere. You know, do we have that bold witness? One of the things I love about these testimonies that happen to be in the Word of God is that as you look at these testimonies, we see examples of this burden, of this desire, of this heart-wrenching sorrow of people that we live with, that happen to be again around us, that happen to be in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, and happen to be in history. You know, one example of that is Jim Elliott, uh, who was a missionary who was martyred by the Aka Indians on January 8, uh, 1957. Everyone remembers his famous quote, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what, that which he cannot lose, right? We're after things, and we want to hang on to things. He said, no, don't hang on to those things. You can't keep it anyways. Give it up. Live for him, who happens to be again eternal. You know, and the amazing thing about Jim Elliot is he wrote many of his prayers in a journal. And so, and so they were handed down to us. He wrote things like, I seek not a long life, but a full one, like you, Lord Jesus. And listen to this one, because I think this is so telling. Because he wrote this, you know, because he saw some flaw, some lack of passion in him. And he writes this to God. Listen to what he writes. He says, forgive me for being so ordinary while claiming to know so extraordinary a God. Isn't it? Hey, I live so ordinary. And yet there's this extraordinary God that happened to be there. Please, please forgive me for having the same desire, the same goals as those that happen to be again around me rather than the goal of this extraordinary God. You know, and I think it's felt in our homes many times. You know, I'm always amazed that you look at the stats that happen to be out there of, uh, of homes of believers in the Lord Jesus Christ and see how many of their children go on and serve Jesus Christ. The stats, again, are amazing. And, and the reason why, I think, many times is because mom and dad claim that there's an extraordinary God here and they live such ordinary lives. You know, all they do is bicker and fight just like their neighbors. All they do is, again, pay their bills just like their neighbors. You know, they say, I got this extraordinary God, but they never show it to the kids by their actions, by their attitudes, by the goals that happen to be in their life. And there is a mission field right in your home with your kids, but please get this, please get this. There is a mission field outside of your home. You know, and have, has you, have your kids ever seen you establish a redemptive relationship? All of, all of a sudden say, you know, this individual, this individual, I'm gonna establish them because I want us, them to see who this extraordinary God is giving up our time, giving up our energy for the glory of this extraordinary God. Let me ask you this morning, how extraordinary is the God of the Bible? Is he worthy of our prayers? Is he worthy of our lips to repeat this message of the greatness of our God that Jesus Christ might be manifested and worshiped by those who curse him right now? for all of eternity. Let's bow our hearts in a moment of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your amazing goodness to us. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you for your care for us. We thank you, Lord, that you're an extraordinary God. But Lord, please forgive us, because all of us, so many times, live so ordinary lives. So many times, Lord, we're so taken up with things that happen to be of the world, Lord, the trials that happen to be of the world, Lord, the disappointments that happen to be of the world, that we don't even notice your, your field, your white field, Lord, that is ready to harvest that happens to be around us. We don't even notice those who are outside of Christ. 
God, we thank you. We thank you that you've given us everything that we need in your word to see you, Lord, to really kindle a passion for you. And we pray that we would verbalize this message for your glory. We thank you again. In Jesus' name, amen.